Today, I'm really excited to be joined by current UNC Women's Hall of Fame coach, Anson Dorrance, who is a 22-time national champion, eight-time national coach of the year, 10-time ACC coach of the year, 1991 U.S. Women's World Cup winning team, a podcast host of uh, Vision of a Champion, which I've talked about in the past, an author. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, Anson, to come on the show. Sir, you're my pleasure. I'm excited to chat with you. So uh, yeah, let's go. So I think you have actually one of the toughest jobs in soccer. Uh, you have to constantly deal with a short kind of player turnaround. I mean, four years, sometimes three years, and we'll get into some of those three years. How do you deal with that, with that constant kind of short-term turnaround? Actually, honestly, it's one of the best jobs in the game. Uh, the collegiate environment uh, is uh, such a comfortable environment for all of us to uh, live and work in. Uh, and I'm excited to still be in it. Um, honestly, if you look at uh, the highest levels of the game, those are incredibly difficult jobs. And even though, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have that much time to turn a team around and get them ready. Uh, what's nice is our opponents don't either. So yeah. we're all sort of on the same uh, you know, playing field. And uh, it is, it's kind of exciting to see if in the course of 21 days, you can get a team ready uh, for competition. Um, but uh, uh, I don't think it's anywhere near the hardest job in the game. My gosh, I look at uh, uh, the uh, coaches that coach in the EPL and, you know, you go on a three game losing streak and all of a sudden everyone starts talking about your job and uh, how uh, they're going to get rid of you. And uh, the stress at that level must be just extraordinary. And even though these absolutely brilliant men jump into these positions, even the truly great ones are fired regularly. I mean, uh, uh, there are very few coaches out there with the resume of, of Jose, uh, and yet uh, he's, he's been fired. Uh, so uh, there's so many different issues that go well beyond your capacity to uh, organize a team and motivate them. Uh, uh, and none of that exists at our level. So yes, uh, we have a short, uh, you know, uh, preparation period at the beginning of a season. But as I said earlier, so do all of our opponents. And so I think we're all of us are going to come into that first game clunking along with pieces missing, uh, with things skipped and with set pieces not entirely polished already defensively and offensively. So I think we're all uh, in the same boat together. That's fair. There, there's some stats I want to read out, and, it, and it'll make sense why I do that in a second, uh, but some player stats. So uh, this is stuff that I found. Uh, so as of 2011, uh, North Carolina had 70 players on the first team All-American uh, recognition list, uh, 11 defensive players of the tournament, 10 offensive players of the NCAA double turn NCAA tournament, uh, five ACC Rookie of the Year, ACC Offensive Player of the Year, four uh, Herman Trophy, and in my opinion, the most amazing stat is 99 uh, current or former players that have gone on to play professional or national team. I mean, you're just a development machine, it seems like. How do you balance development and winning? Well, honestly, we've never separated the two, uh, but uh, you've hit something uh, uh, on the head, which I really appreciate because my passion is player development. <clears throat> so much so to some extent right now, uh, it's hurting us a bit in the, uh, this era of uh, uh, the pandemic where people have uh, seniors playing and fifth years playing and graduate transfers playing because we want to get our kids into the pro leagues as fast as possible. And uh, we are really struggling against so many of these teams now because we just launched all of our seniors uh, last August, uh, and not this recent August, the August before, we had a fabulous senior class, uh, Alessia Russo. We said, you know, there's no uh, uh, national championship this fall, so just chase your dreams. And I know your dream is to play for Manchester United, so we sent her off to Manchester United. We had a kid that wanted to rejoin her uh, youth club at Arsenal, and we sent her back to England to play for the Arsenal. And then we sent Lois Joel to play for West Ham. We sent uh, Emily Fox. Uh, as a first round draft choice, first pick in the first round uh, to play for Louisville in the NWSL. We sent Taylor Otto off and then uh, basically uh, Pinto, probably our best uh, uh, player during a stretch. We also sent uh, off to Gotham. So we were just launching one player after the other to get them into the pro leagues as fast as possible. 
And then, of course, that came back to bite us in the rear end. Uh, we were, you know, eliminated uh, from the first round of the NCAA tournament this year. Why? Because we didn't have, uh, with the exception of one senior playing, we had a, a couple seniors on the roster, but only one was starting for us. Why? Because we had sent them all off. Um, so uh, um, <laughs> sometimes this player development thing does uh, make it difficult for us to compete like it has this past year. But what was really exciting in the last game of the United States, uh, Emily Fox got uh, a player of the match for the U.S. down in Australia, played a brilliant game as the left back, starting left back for the United States. Uh, uh, Lata Wuben Moyne made the Great Britain uh, Olympic roster, which is fantastic. Basically, she made it as a college senior. Alessia Russo uh, just recently scored a hat trick in her first start for, uh, for England. Uh, so, uh, um, so for me, uh, you know, yeah, it all comes down to player development. And if you're doing it properly in player development and you're recruiting well, you're going to compete successfully. Uh, so for me, everything is about player development. How can we get these kids to higher and higher levels? And actually that book you picked up uh, that you held up in front of me that you clearly must have bought on eBay, which as I mentioned to you earlier, drove the price up so much so that uh, a printing company said, Anson, now we got to reprint this book. Look at what it's selling for on eBay. Um, and you're right, that, that book is still relevant. As I mentioned earlier, 20% of it is obsolete, but 80% still has value. And uh, yeah, the principles in that book are the foundation for us in helping our kids uh, uh, develop in this game uh, to the highest possible level. And we're very proud of everything you just shared, by the way. In fact, uh, I'm gonna have my sports information director call you up and get all that <laughs> research data that you've assembled. And we're gonna send that out in a recruiting letter to all the kids that we're chasing right now. So uh, thank you for that uh, wonderfully glorious research uh, you put together for us because it certainly makes us look good. Well, I, I think too, what's great is that it's not just talk because even when I watch your games now, and it, it's really interesting to be able to, well, I'm in Canada, I'm in Toronto, so I'm, I'm able to watch it through YouTube. But when I watch your teams, I see that development in what you call game changers. Can you talk a little bit about that and what, uh, how you started essentially putting on another team within the game? And again, player development, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've never been one of these guys that's married to uh, the classic tenants of FIFA. Um, uh, the FIFA substitution rules say you sub three in and that's it. And that's all you can do. And yet uh, uh, the way these professional teams try to work around that is they try to have such uh, an incredibly uh, talented roster. They are in a position to play basically two completely separate teams. So when you watch Manchester City play, there was a stretch of games where they never had the same starting team for two games in a row for like 34 games in a row or something. It was like incredible. And how could they afford to do this? Well, because at Man City, uh, the checkbook's not an issue. So they're signing everyone they need to. And so their bench is a team that would probably finish second in the EPL. And so what are they able to do? Well, what they're able to do is if they're resting legs for a Champions League game or they're trying to advance in the FA Cup, they put a completely different roster on the field. And of course, they can afford to because of their extraordinary depth. Well, I've never felt that these NCAA rules uh, have to follow FIFA. And even though I have a lot of colleagues that are married to uh, uh, the traditions in the game by having very few substitutions. Way back, even in the beginning, when I started coaching, I was thinking, this is ridiculous. We're going to high press for 90 minutes. And if we're going to high press, the press is going to die in about 30 minutes. And sometimes it dies in 20 minutes. In fact, if we're really not that fit, it'll die in 15 minutes. Uh, so what we want to be able to do is as soon as some kid dies, because we are going to press for 90 minutes, we're going to drag that wasted carcass off the field and sub in some fresh blood, uh, basically to continue the press. Now, the kids that we start are technically and tactically and sometimes athletically more gifted than the kids we're subbing in. But in terms of energy levels, um, you know, the energy level of a, a reserve coming in uh, is generally going to be better than the kid you're pulling out. And so we call the demarcation of our substitution line to be this. When is the inferior player fresh better than the superior player fatigued? And that is the demarcation line of when we sub. So we want to play the kids we recruit. 
uh, we try to bring in uh, uh, five to uh, seven kids a year, every year in recruiting. And what we want to do is we want to be able to play them all. And a lot of schools have a different philosophy. They want to try to stay with, you know, a set of a group of players for as long as possible. But very few of these teams press for 90 minutes. A lot of them play with a low line of confrontation that's uh, usually, I would say, halfway between uh, the top of the D and the tangent of the center circle. So somewhere between those two imaginary lines is where they pick up the press. And obviously, these are sophisticated coaches. They know about the game. They know that, you know, when we play a, a ball into an outside bag, that's when their press is initiated in this distance halfway between the top of the D and the tangent of the center circle. And that's when they initiate their press. And obviously, if that's the case, uh, you're going to have a team that is going to be more rested than our team. So those teams can certainly possibly afford to play those players a bit longer. But getting back to your introduction about uh, uh, player development, and I genuinely appreciate by the, that, by the way, is we think if you want to really develop an elite player, you don't want that player to ever take a break in the game. Because if you look at the elite teams at the highest level now, and by the way, we've been pressing forever. We've been pressing long before it became popular in the EPL. We were, you know, pressing long before, you know, anyone ever heard about uh, Klopp or, uh, you know, uh, Pep and all of these, you know, studs that have brilliant ideas in uh, pressing. And of course, the new Manchester United coach, it was so exciting <clears throat> watching his one game impact as a coach from the game before he got there and the game after he got there, oh my gosh, he has Cristiano Ronaldo pressing for Manchester United. Yep. Are you kidding me? I mean, players like that can sort of look at the coach and say, no, sorry, I don't press. I am, in, I am saving all of my energy to attack. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna press. And yet this guy has Cristiano Ronaldo pressing. I saw him make this 30 yard sprint at the goalkeeper. I was thinking, oh my gosh, this guy's a coaching genius to get this, you know, one of the greatest players of all time to actually do some of the slogging work of the classic defensive midfielders. And so I was just really impressed with this. Well, we've always done this. And so the game changers are the kids we sub in. And I think one of the reasons over the years we've been consistently successful is because the kids that are end up starting for us have generally spent time coming in off the bench. And even though right now, because again, we sent all of our seniors off, we had a whole slew of young kids starting uh, the last couple of years. In general, um, the kids that end up starting for us have you know, fought their way into the starting lineup. But the game changers are fresh and they come in. And honestly, um, I certainly listen to the games that are televised. And I remember there was a color commentator uh, that made a comment that came from a team that really prided themselves on possession. And so her assumption when we substituted is the rhythm wouldn't be as good. And so I called her up after the game and she was making these comments about when we subbed our team in. I said, did you actually watch the game you were color commentating in? And do you actually really believe that the reserve unit don't play with the same kind of rhythm that the starters play with? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I listened to your commentary on our game and because you come from sort of a classic uh, school of possession, the, the assumption all of you guys have that come from these classic uh, possession environments is that when you substitute, you ruin the continuity of the team that's used to playing with each other, and then the rhythm breaks down. Let me share something about my game changers, my substitutes. They actually play a higher level of the possession game than my starters do. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, because my starters are 1v1 artists. So when they get the ball, they have one idea. They're gonna get the ball and just start carving. They're gonna to try to get in the box to create a chance or finish a chance or cross the ball. And as a result, they don't actually play the game at the level that my reserves do. Because the reserves are more cooperative because they don't have the ability to go right through people one-on-one -on -one like my starters do. So they're much better at changing the point of the attack, playing through the lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and keeping the ball. And she was sort of shocked that we're sharing this. But then my assumption is when she went back to look at that game, she probably said, oh, my gosh, hmm. Anson is absolutely correct. His reserves do play a better possessional game than his starters do. And so uh, we uh, basically want uh, to play as many players as we can. And if you will press 
uh, you will play. In other words, if you will make sure that defensively, we're not going to give up a goal if you're on the field, we're going to try to get you out there. And yet uh, people try to use this against us in recruiting that uh, the counterintuitive uh, proposition that I'm proposing, which is no, come to North Carolina and your odds of making the U.S. full team and signing a pro contract are incredible. And it's counterintuitive because what my opponents are saying when they recruit against us, this is ridiculous. If you're on the field for us, you're going to play 90 minutes. Surely you're going to develop more in 90 minutes in a match with us than, you know, the 60 to 70 minutes on the field for Anson. But the difference is a lot of the time when they're playing for these teams that do have a low line of confrontation, they're not playing. They're standing there with their thumbs stuck up their nostrils and they're not working. So yeah, you're going to, you know, play for 90 minutes, but for at least 30 to 40 minutes of that, you're going to be doing absolutely nothing as you're going through the uh, disguise of playing a low line of confrontation. So please don't have any delusions about your player development. Uh, because if you're just standing there with your thumb stuck up your nost nostrils, you're not developing. With us, you're working. You're working when we have possession and you're working when we don't. And the kids like Mia Hamm and Christine Lilly, by the time they were graduated, they were playing 80 minutes a game. So you got to work up to that because to play 80 minutes a game in our pressing system, you got to hit a beep of over 50 in order to endure at that level. And obviously, these are the kids that Vladko wants because he wants to press. And so did Jill Ellis. And so Jill Ellis loved the Carolina players. I mean, heck, for her uh, world championship in 2015, she had uh, six Tar Heels on the roster. I mean, that was, you know, one third of the roster. And uh, the same thing uh, in uh, uh, 2019, she had five on the roster. And so uh, basically, uh, she loved the Tar Heels because here's what she knew. She knew when she threw them out there, they were going to press. And she also knew they were going to be complete players. They're going to attack and defend. And also they could play multiple positions. I mean, no better example than Crystal Dunn that went from the 10 or actually the seven, the nine and the 11 to left back. And also Tobin Heath, who started out in midfield. And then basically now she's retiring as sort of a striker for the U.S. full teams. And so uh, I'm very proud of my game changers. I'm very proud of the, the system we play and very proud of the difference between us and uh, most of my, by the way, outstanding colleagues, because they certainly have a lot of very good uh, coaching colleagues that certainly make us better. I mean, I think that's awesome. There's so much we can unpack there. Uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me w w when you when you just said all that and listening, obviously, to your podcast is something that you say, which is steel sharpens steel. Um, and, and, and that's clear. I mean, it, in that philosophy of you know, working hard and kind of having these game changers coming on and these game changers eventually, as you mentioned, becoming these starters, you know, there's a work ethic there that they got to, you know, go against these, you know, not, not in a bad way, but go against these top players who are already world-class and we've proven that based on, you know, the players have gotten recruited to the next level. So that steel sharpening steel, uh, it is clear. I, it's funny. I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, over the years, when you kind of look at an Anson Dorn's team, uh, what are the things that we should look out for when we're watching an Anson Dorn's team? But I think you you answered that, you know, with that press, um, which is, you know, hard work ethic. What else when you when you're kind of building a team, uh, let's say even this year, a brand new team with a bunch of uh, players going off playing pro and you maybe you're at your first friendly or your first big game. What are kind of the things that you're looking for, the points that you're kind of going, okay, this is a North Carolina team. I can see that because of one press. What else? Yeah. Well, the press is uh, something that has never changed. Yeah. Now, sometimes our systems change because for years we were married to the one, three, four, three. And uh, that first world championship that we won in uh, 1991 in Guangzhou, China, uh, we played a uh, one, three, four, three. But it was different uh, because that system evolved to a degree. Because back then we played with two marking backs and a deep sweeper. Yeah. Uh, Carla Worden Overbeck was our deep sweeper. Mary Harvey was in goal. And the two marking backs were Belkin uh, and uh, um, Hamilton, but also uh, uh, Joy B. Field Fawcett. Uh, so for us, um, uh, we wanted to play a system that would, was going to make it very hard for the other teams. And during that stretch, in the international game, most of the teams we played against in that World Cup 
played a very classic 4-4-2. Uh, basically, uh, two front runners. And so we would uh, basically sort out from the two front runners what the best matchup was. Because the nice thing about playing man-to-man -man is you get to pick the matchup. Yeah. So if they had an extraordinarily fast player, we would put uh, Joy on her because Joy is incredibly fast. If they had a very technical player that hated contact, uh, Hamilton uh, draw uh, drew the uh, matchup because Hamilton just enjoyed, you know, beating players to a, a bloody pulp and was very intimidating. Um, so we would we would select the matchup. But then what was critical, since uh, the other team could dictate our shape when we won possession by movement, because if you're marking man to man, when you win possession, the other team has dictated your transition shape basically by where the uh, two strikers had moved. Yep. What was critical was the shape of our outside midfielders. And during that world championship, <clears throat> they were uh, Christine Lilly on the left and Mia Hamm on the right. And so basically in transition, those in effect became the outside backs. Uh, but they were the outside backs that were basically right back, right midfielder, right wing. So that was Mia Hamm, left back, left midfielder, left wing, and that was Lilly. And these are two incredibly talented attacking players. And now they're coming out of the defense for us. And so this made it very difficult for opponents to sort of figure out a way to stop us because then we also had two uh, magnificent midfielders that were completely contrasting players. One was Julie Foudy, who was sort of like a galloping penetrate with the ball midfielder. And the other one was just a classic trap and pass playmaker in Shannon Higgins. And then, of course, we had in the nine, the incomparable Michelle Akers, who could do everything. She could get in behind with pace. She could hold it up well for us. She would win every head ball. She could beat people off the dribble. She could score with both feet. The left wing was one of the best dribblers I've ever seen in my life in Karen Jennings Cabrera. And then the right wing was, again, the super competitive April Heinrichs, who could just go through you with pace, go through you with power, go through you with aggression. So back in those days, that system, the one, three, four, three was markers and a sweeper in the back. As we evolved at UNC, we took that system. And then all of a sudden I'm in a tournament in, uh, I think Houston, Texas, and I'm looking at my uh, system and I'm thinking, this, isn't, this is not working. But at halftime of this event, we decided to shift, and this is absolutely nuts. We decided to shift from markers and a sweeper to a flat three. And all of a sudden, the very reason that it was difficult for us to win possession in good attacking positions in our marking and sweeping system allowed us to win the ball in wonderful positions in the uh, semi flat back one, three, four, three. Because what we noticed is my markers were so good. If one of their players made a run, my marker would be right with them. But the other team, because of our press, wasn't very good at playing the ball into the person they're trying to hit. <clears throat> so because my markers were so good, it made every errant pass a 50-50 ball for us to win. Because when the pass isn't accurate, now both the player that the ball was tried to be passed to and our defender have a similar distance to get to the free ball. And so in transition, we were getting tackled aggressively because we were so good at tracking aggressively. And so I was thinking, this is absurd. So all of a sudden at the half, we shifted and here's what ended up happening. Because of our high press, the accuracy of the balls out of the back for the other team and in midfield in trying to hit the front runners was so poor, they were playing it into our shape. So now all of a sudden my right back was played a ball and my right back wasn't necessarily tracking one of the uh, players on the other team, but the ball was played right to her because of the press we had instituted against the other team's left back. And so the other team's left back were playing it right into the feet of my right back. And now in transition, we are off to the races. And so it was interesting. And this again, is very counterintuitive. The fact that we were such good markers made it more difficult for us to win the ball. And yet, if we have a good shape, they were playing the ball into our shape and not into their teammates. And that made our attacking transition so much better. And so from then on, and I can't remember when the shift was made, but it was probably uh, maybe 1993 or four or five. 
Um, and ever since then, for the longest period, we've played the semi flat back one, three, four, three. And then all of a sudden, uh, for that system to fly, you've got to have some pace in the back. You also have some have to have some extraordinary flank midfielders. And there was a stretch when uh, the standard of our flank midfielders dropped a bit. Um, and uh, the luxury of us being faster in the back than all the other teams who are playing against dropped a bit. So then we started playing other systems like the 4-2-3-1, which we played for a while. And then the last couple of seasons we've played with the reserve unit, certainly the 4-3-3. Although we've also this year, the starters played a one, five, uh, uh, one, three, five, two. So now we've played a lot of uh, uh, different systems. Uh, and basically we figured out a way to press effectively out of multiple systems. And what but about originally we were married to the one, three, four, three, because it's the easiest system to press out of. And what about more characteristic wise of what you're looking for? Not necessarily formation based from a team. In terms of uh, uh, playing personalities, yeah, we've got to recruit kids that have no issue uh, pressing and defending. Uh, but then uh, based on their positions, they all have to have certain qualities. We're also very big on uh, uh, beating players off the dribble. So whenever we see a really good one-on-one -on -one player, we're going to chase them. And in our training environments, we have five different one-on-one -on -one competitions because we want to hone that quality. If you have a player that's capable of beating players off the dribble, uh, they're going to make it so hard for the opponent uh, to match up effectively against uh, those kinds of players. And so we start with the press. Uh, will you defend? Uh, and then we uh, sort of morph into uh, your ability to beat people off the dribble. Uh, and then obviously all the other things in the women's game. If you can head the ball incredibly well, that puts you in a remarkable position because very few uh, women are great headers. And so uh, that quality is also going to separate you. So capacity to press, capacity to beat people off the dribble, your capacity to win balls in the air. And all these things we're talking about right now are mentality uh, challenges because these are all about uh, dueling. So we wanna be the team that wins the individual duels. We wanna win them defensively. We wanna win them offensively. So tackling people, going through people 1v1, winning balls in the air. Uh, these, th these are all characteristic uh, of the duel. And I brought in an absolutely brilliant coach uh, recently by the name of Damon Nahas. And what he's bringing into this dueling mentality I've always had as a coach is the more sophisticated uh, playing through the lines and possessional qualities that obviously all the great teams have to have if they wanna try to separate. And so he was a great addition uh, because uh, we talk about our, uh, I guess, a coaching marriage as a fusion uh, between his ideas and mine. And we think that fusion is a fantastic uh, a blend of the most critical elements in player development, because the other passion that he has is that. So all we talk about all day is player development, how we can get this player to another level. And it's uh, a fusion of his ideas and mine. Uh, so we're uh, obviously excited about where we are, but also excited about where we're going. You know, I think what you said was really interesting because not a lot of coaches have that understanding of a really fluid system. And what you said there, when you're pressing, what you're actually doing is you're getting ready for attack. Because when you press with that, uh, with that front three that you mentioned, and they're not good necessarily at playing the ball in the back and keeping possession, that ball goes long. So what you've done is you've turned defending into another element of getting ready for attacking. And I think those, that's really what the best coaches do when they're, even when they're in attack, they're already using some elements of their attacking shape to get ready for defense. So I thought, I thought that was really great. Um, we're definitely going to talk about the training environment because that's so important and stuff that I want other coaches to hear from you. Uh, but there are some other things that I want to talk about first, uh, and that's culture. Um, culture has to be one of the most important things with such a, a winning program like yours. Um, so I have some questions with that. First, how do you start building a winning culture? Like where would you even go to start that? Well, um, when you're constructing uh, your own culture, um, sometimes you're sort of you know groping in the dark uh, to come up with uh, principles that make all the difference in the world. And I think we all have to coach through our own personalities. 
And uh, uh, my personality is a very competitive one. So when we started to feel that uh, pressing was gonna be critical for us, it's not like uh, that was a stretch for me. That was the way I, I personally played uh, as a player at the University of North Carolina, uh, but not just as a soccer player. This competitive fire element has been a part of my personality forever. And even though I think most coaches would certainly claim to be very competitive, um, I don't think uh, uh, most people are as competitive as they think they are. Um, and, you know, the way I guess a person would start to believe they're more competitive uh, than anyone else is through bad behavior. Like if you act, you know, wounded or, you know, completely catatonically depressed, if you lose, that that demonstrates you're competitive. No, that just demonstrates you're a frigging idiot. No, uh, the, the capacity to compete effectively is to always be turned on to try to get the best out of yourself at all times, to try to win at everything you can as consistently as possible um, every second of every day. Um, so it's a, sort of a commitment to a certain standard of, of, of excellence uh, when you're competing. And when I compete, I try to compete in everything. So uh, one of the stories, one of my favorite stories that I talk about all the time is uh, when I transferred into the University of North Carolina, because my uh, first semester was spent, uh, spent at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, when I transferred into UNC, I moved into Teague Dorm. And Teague Dorm uh, was run by uh, an intramural manager uh, that came into my room as soon as I got there and said, you know, Anson, uh, uh, we take uh, intramurals very seriously here in Teague Dorm. And uh, we would like, uh, we heard you were an athlete and we would love to recruit you to play on one of our intramural teams. Do you mind looking at this list of winter and spring sports? and tell us you know, which sports you think you can uh, succeed in uh, to compete uh, for the doorman. So he hands me this long list of sports in the winter and spring. And I looked at all of them and I handed the clipboard back to him and I said, you know, uh, the guy's name was Danny Newcomb. I said, Danny, um, if you wanna win, put me on every single team. And he thought I was joking and I was not joking. Um, and sure enough, they put me on every single team and we started together an 11 year intramural sports dynasty out of Teague dorm. Uh, it was irritating the intramural department at UNC to such a large extent is while I was still staying in Teague, they wanted to break up this, this dominance and they cut the dorm in half. So then two of the floors were Teague one and then the other floors were, were Teague two. We moved all the athletes in the same two floors and we continued to win. And uh, there's not a sport out there I don't love to play and compete in. And so this has always been a part of my DNA. Um, and it's really interesting. The other day, uh, I love listening to these political news shows. And I was listening to Rachel Maddow, who's on MSNBC. And she was talking about uh, uh, bringing this expert on to talk about something. And so she's listening to this expert talk. And she introduced him as an expert uh, with him listening in. And then all of a sudden the expert comes on and he, he threw back at her. He says, well, uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Rachel. Uh, uh, I appreciate you declaring me an expert in whatever it was, you know, he's qualified to, to speak on. And then he threw back at her, you know, Rachel, what are you an expert in? And all of a sudden I see uh, Rachel Maddow start to, you know, look up uh, thinking about what she was an expert in. Then she looks back at the camera and she says, I'm an expert in reading comprehension. And I was thinking, that is absolutely fascinating, but it's also spot on. Because what she's really good at for me is explaining things to me. So she gets something that she reads, some political issue that's out there. And not only does she read it well and comprehend it well, but to show your comprehension for something, try to explain it. And she is so good at explaining it. So it was clear she checked the reading comprehension box. So all of a sudden I'm watching this show and this was within the last two years. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, well, what am I an expert in? Um, I think there are a lot of people out there that know more about the game than I do. I think there are people out there that uh, probably know more about the psychology of, of players than I do. I think there are people out there that might be better motivators um, and I kept looking at all the different things. And then all of a sudden I had this aha moment. And I was thinking to myself, I am an expert in competition. 
That's my expertise. So what I think I am particularly good at, and I certainly know some things about the game, but I think what I am particularly good at is getting a player to find their competitive edge. Because we talk about 10 different things for uh, individual player development. We talk about competitive fire. We talk about, you know, uh, self-discipline. We talk about self-belief. We talk about love of the ball, love of playing the game, love of watching the game. We talk about grit, coachability. We talk about connection. We talk about all these different elements that I think play into making you an elite player. But the ring that rules them all, in my opinion, is competitive fire. And I think the quality that separates me as a coach is to find that button that can eventually take this player to her competitive best. And for her competitive best, it doesn't just have to show up in the match she's playing in, but it has to show up in practice, but it also has to show up in the environments outside of practice where she's honing her skill set or her fitness level in order to come into practice to effectively win. So it basically, in my opinion, shapes the entire, I guess, range of what's critical for her in player development. So for me, that's what I think um, I'm best at. Now, let's go into training because you talked about competitive edge. What does that look like in your training sessions? And what I mean by that is, um, what are some sessions that you use? And I know you use uh, a really kind of unique uh, uh, grid and um, 1v1 and matrix and, and all that. So what does a practice look like at North Carolina that really gets the competitive edge across? We have something we call fitness day, which is the hardest day of the week. And if we can get this practice in, um, I absolutely love it. And this day starts with the kids warming up with our strength coach, Greg Gatz. <clears throat> and then Damon Nehas, who's a master of technical training, puts the uh, players through sort of a dribbling, <clears throat> a non-contact dribbling session uh, where they're doing these different forms of dribbling uh, using, you know, all surfaces of both feet, but doing different sorts of moves to beat players with, you know, stop and goes, uh, spin outs and different ways that you would approach attacking a player 1v1. And that's sort of like the post warm-up warm-up for the 1v1 competitions. And so right after Damon does that with them, uh, my uh, uh, director of ops, <clears throat> a guy by the name of Tom Sander, reads off the 1v1 competitions for the day. We have three different uh, 1v1 platforms that go on at the same time during fitness day. Uh, one of them is 1v1 to big goals. So one goal is set up on the end line. The other goal is set up at the tangent of the D. So basically it's uh, these two goals are 22 yards apart. The uh, area that you're playing in is basically the penalty box. So the width is the width of the penalty box. You've got a live goalkeeper in each of these goals because these are regulation goals. And then you've got the two players out there that are competing 1v1. If we have enough goalkeepers, we have four goals set up that way. So two in one uh, sort of penalty area and two goals in the other penalty area. So just envision the field. So you've got these four large goals set up on the end lines, but also on the top of the D with live goalkeepers in these four goals. Then we've got these small sort of uh, PVC piping, small goals that are set up on one side of the field. <clears throat> and then we also have a uh, large uh, traffic cones or uh, barrels uh, that are set up in another part of the field. If a kid's coming back from an injury, uh, we don't want to put them at risk. So we don't put them in the uh, uh, big goals against each other or even in the small goals. We put them against the barrels or the uh, large traffic cones. <clears throat> so based on as the kids are coming back from injury, they still uh, compete in 1v1, but it's a more benign 1v1 in terms of injury risk. Now it's, it's exhausting because uh, when you shoot a ball at a barrel and it misses, and there's only one barrel both of you are shooting at, if it misses, both of you have to sprint after the ball. And if one girl sort of uh, does what we call cone hanging or barrel hanging, hanging out near the barrel to defend, uh, and the other girl screams out, Anson, you know, she's, you know, cheating, 
I'll turn and look. And if she's not sprinting at the ball with this, this other girl, I award a goal immediately for the girl that's working. So this is fitness day. So basically uh, this goes on and every single time we rotate, they play a different player, but it's all done off the matrix. So through the course of the season, they've played every girl 1v1 at least once. Um, now, obviously I put my strikers and my best players against uh, the live goalkeepers. So they're finishing against live goalkeepers. We play four 1v1 games. <clears throat> uh, the games are basically, it just lasts a minute. Uh, and then they have two minutes off because the last thing I want to do is to have a player injured during the 1v1. So they have full rest. Uh, now, going against the big goals is most exhausting. Uh, going against the barrels is second most exhausting. Uh, so basically, if a girl's going big goals, big goals, big goals, she's going to be absolutely exhausted. And so we want to give them sufficient rest. So four 1v1 battles all against a different player. Uh, and then at the end of that, all the players sprint to uh, me and Tom and Tom standing there with the clipboard to record the results and the girls rip off win loss time. <clears throat> so if they were incredibly successful 4 0 and 0, they beat everyone. But usually it's not that it's like, you know, two, one and one or something or one, two and one, et cetera. So they have some ties. They have some losses. But every now and again, a girl will be undefeated. And if a girl's undefeated, even, even if it's 2 0 and 2, everyone applauds because we admire the ones that, you know, don't get beaten. Uh, so there's a, you know, a small ceremony at the end. But if the girls don't sprint in at the end of this, the whole team is doing sit-ups. And so basically every time we pull them together, they come together at a sprint for two reasons. First of all, to show respect for the coach that's running the session, but also because there's only so much time and you can't afford to wait for a player that's sort of lollygagging in. At the beginning of practice, before the warm up or during the warm up, the girls have also picked four 6v6 or 7v7 teams. It's done through a draft. So after a four minute rest, after the end of the 1v1s, they now play, you know, 5v5, 6v6, 7v7. Uh, the size of the field is based on the numbers involved, and we have a preconceived Raymond Verhan field shape. Uh, based on his periodization model for uh, uh, the fitness development playing half field games. And so the shape of the field is basically based on the numbers we have that day. And then they play three games. They play each team once. Um, I will stand on one field. And as soon as my game ends, uh, the winners keep coming to my field. And then finally, in the final game, the two teams that haven't played each other uh, play in that final game. Um, and that's basically periodization. So early in the season, these games only last about four minutes, but by the NCAA tournament, these games are like six minutes long because as we get fitter, <clears throat> the length of these games get longer. Then we take another four minute break and then we play um, Bielsa's murder ball. I don't know if you've been following Leeds and what uh, Bielsa's done at Leeds, but the amount of, uh, of ground that Bielsa's players cover and a typical match at Leeds is extraordinary. So I became a huge fan of Leeds as soon as Bielsa entered the league last year. And of course, with the second most poverty stricken roster in the EPL, his overachievement at Leeds last year was extraordinary. Now they're struggling a bit more this year, but I love his principles. <clears throat> and so we play uh, three to four scrimmages of murder ball. What is three murder ball for those that Excuse don't know? Me? What is murder ball for those? Yeah, murder ball is basically an 11 v 11 scrimmage where there's no stoppage. So let's assume some girl takes a shot and it goes over the goal. Uh, the goalkeeper doesn't get a ball, put it down on the edge of the six and then play a goal kick. No, uh, Damon Nahas is standing out there in the field with me and he's got two or three balls in his arms. And as soon as the ball is shot over the bar, he rolls the ball out arbitrarily anywhere. And so the transition is to defend wherever the ball is now. And the ball is rolled out as soon as the ball sails over the bar. <clears throat> but also as soon as it goes out of bounds, there's no throw in. He will roll another ball out somewhere. And he's usually trying to put uh, the starting team at a disadvantage. Or if he appreciates the way the starting team has played, uh, he will continue the advantage for the starting team. So what he'll do a lot if uh, we're irritated with the way the starting team is defending, if it goes out of bounds and it's the starting team's ball, he won't give it back to the starting team. 
he'll give it to the reserve team if we're playing in this particular moment in this 11 v 11 start of reserves because he wants our kids to work more defensively. So he gets to dictate uh, where the ball begins. And again, there's absolutely no stoppage. So it's three minutes on, a minute and a half off. And we'll have different permutations of the murder ball teams. Sometimes it is starters reserves. <clears throat> Sometimes it's front six back five. Front six back five is uh, the attacking players will play against the starting defensive players. So starting attackers will team up with the reserve defenders against the starting defenders and reserve attackers. Do you understand what I mean yeah. by that shape? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so sometimes the 11 v 11 is a blend of that. Um, uh, but basically it's <clears throat> basically four games of three minutes and it's absolutely exhausting because there's no stoppage. Because in a soccer game, there's a lot of stoppage if you think about it. Yeah. Anytime there's a throw in, there's stoppage. Anytime there's a goal kick or you know, a free kick or, you know, any kind of foul, same thing. If there's a foul, there's no stoppage. Um, <clears throat> the girl will just dust herself off and the ball's still going. Now, obviously we don't want them literally murdering each other. Uh, so, you know, we will have them, you know, make sure that, <clears throat> um, you know, don't do that again. Uh, we don't want them actually injuring each other. Uh, but uh, murder ball is uh, an incredibly intense experience <clears throat> so that's uh that's basically a fitness day that's awesome um i have three more questions left <laughs> uh so oh and by the way let me share some more stuff because i don't want everyone to think that all we do is fitness all the time no <clears throat> damon <clears throat> nahas is so good at uh, um uh, tempo passing and he's got a lot of exercises where the ball's moving around in a certain pattern you know, a la the uh, Barcelonas and the Manchester cities and passing patterns <clears throat> where you're just doing everything at a sprint with yeah. high tempo, high tempo passing. And he's got a lot of these different designs that are great. And then obviously different sorts of possessional games, uh, transition games, uh, finishing games. Um, and we have a lot more 1v1s than just those 1v1s I shared. We have what we call bogeys uh, 1v1s, which is back to pressure <clears throat> 1v1s in the box. That's really low uh, impact 1v1s. Uh, we've got, you know, different things we're doing that we'll be certainly doing this spring in back to goal because we weren't very good back to goal this past uh, fall. So we've got all these different 1v1 ideas. So please don't think that's the extent of our training environments. No, uh, <clears throat> Damon's ideas <clears throat> are fabulous for practice and they're all tactically tinged uh, and technically uh, 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 challenged. Uh, so for us, uh, uh, there's so much going on that we help uh, with our kids. And then we have four different 1v1, uh, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry, four different heading competitions uh, because that's such a weak area in the women's game. And uh, the heading competitions are designed. So if a kid is afraid to head, we actually have balls pumped up well below the standard. So a girl is in effect heading a volleyball yeah. uh, because we don't want them to be afraid of heading. And some of the girls that come in actually <clears throat> their youth coaches don't work on heading. And these are good players. I mean, uh, we uh, bring in players from uh, uh, the PDA team in Jersey, and they're a phenomenal club. And uh, they just uh, think uh, the game should be played with a ball on the ground, which I love. And so they don't work on heading. Yeah. And of course, I tease all my PDA kids. Well, what if the other team, you know, sends the ball up in the air? What do you guys do? Do you just wait for it to bounce slowly to the ground? And of course, you know, it's just teasing them because these are elite players. And I love the concept that PDA uses for coaching their kids because, yeah, <clears throat> the elite game is the ball on the ground. And these PDA kids we bring in like Heather O'Reilly, like Tobin Heath, some of the you know greatest American players of all time. Uh, PDA does an absolutely brilliant job. So I am not, you know, disrespecting their ideas, but they do come in with a uh, very average uh, uh, to poor heading platforms. <clears throat> so we have, you know, four different heading exercises and competitions that try to get them uh, up to speed as fast as possible. I think that's awesome. I think based on kind of what you shared, we can really see the identity of what you spoke about earlier with that competitive edge and steel sharpening steel. Uh, for me, I coached um, way back when at this point, um, at a at a private girls school here in Toronto and it was it happened to be that year that I coached it was a group of girls that play at the highest level here in Toronto 
And what struck me the most was before every single game, uh, they got together and they did their chant. And their chant was always, we're number one, not two, not three, not four. We're going to win, not lose, not tie the score. And it seemed that right after that, they all kind of just looked at each other and they were like, we're not going to lose this game. Do you have any rituals or things that you do with your team that as soon as it kind of happens, you can kind of see something shift? I don't know if that yeah, they also, fun. we have uh, pregame rituals as well. And unfortunately, because of the language involved in these pregame rituals, I can't share with you the detail of it. Uh, but basically, before every game, they have their own chant. <clears throat> and the chant was actually <clears throat> a mistake we made years ago in the first half against Duke back when they were building a new uh, uh, game field for us. We were down in our practice complex and we were playing Duke. And Duke completely dominated the first half against us. And I got them together at the half, and I was so upset with them. <clears throat> And uh, basically, a team like ours, um, er we're going to get everyone's best shot. We're a big scalp, and so everyone would love to beat us. And so every team comes into our game uh, ready to compete at the highest level. So <clears throat> most of the teams we play against don't come in lackluster. They come in fired up. And so we've got this uh, FTS, um, which stands for something, and the words in this FTS aren't the nicest words in the English language. So <clears throat> I'm certainly not at liberty to share this, but basically it was the uh, reaction I had after watching us <clears throat> go in against a Duke team that was highly motivated and seeing our girls try to compete not being highly motivated. And so we have a similar ritual uh, before the game. Uh, and the players obviously also bring their own stuff in. So based on the leadership every year, uh, it seems like every uh, leadership class has a different thing uh, they're going to share with the kids. Um, and some of these things are a lot more benign than FTS. Um, one of them is love, team, family, um, which in my mind, I'm thinking, how the heck does that get anyone up to play in a competitive match? So uh, I'm not the sort of guy that, you know, before I compete in something, I'm thinking love, team, family. Um, <laughs> Now that doesn't really, you know, get my competitive juices flowing, but if this is something that connects them, I love it because we do talk about connection all the time. Um, and we want them to connect. We want them to, you know, love their teammates and we want their teammates to love them. And, and so this is certainly a part of any, I think, outstanding team is to have wonderful chemistry, to have great leadership. Um, but we uh, do have rituals uh, and they are connective. Uh, they are motivational. And uh, I think they do make a difference. That's awesome. I want to ask, and, and I don't know how much you know about this. I don't know if this is a thing. It's just something that I searched up. Um, but your camps, mainly for a lot of the listeners are youth coaches. And let's say I have, you know, 12 year old uh, young girl who I would love to get on your radar. What's something that a coach can do? Uh, what are these camps? Is this even something that exists? Like, I don't know, because I just did some research on it. Um, and then you can also maybe talk about uh, how the recruiting process works for you guys. Sure. Well, we've got uh, <clears throat> uh, camps year round. We've got camps in the summer, which are, you know, three or four day camps. We've also got ID camps that sometimes are only as long as a day and a half or, or uh, you know, two days. Um, and so during the year, uh, we've got a, an ID camp in February. We've got an ID camp usually in April and usually one in August. But then we've got the regular summer camps. And so if they go on our camp website um, and uh, they'll be, be able to see these weeks that they can sign up for, that allows us to certainly look at them. And we actually are, are pretty good at uh, getting a consistent number of uh, visitors from Canada that come down to basically show their wares to us. <clears throat> and one thing we're very proud of is the first two players in the Canadian Women's Soccer Hall of Fame are Tar Heels. Uh, if anyone does the research, uh, the first player inducted is Carrie Sirwetnik. Uh, she played on the front line with the April Heinrichs I was describing uh, on the U.S. women's national team that was the right wing for the United States. Well, Carrie Sirwetnik was April Heinrichs's nine. She was the uh, very hardworking uh, center forward that also played on the Canadian full national team. The second player inducted into the Canadian uh, National Soccer Hall of Fame on the women's side was Angie Kelly. Angie Kelly has uh, Grosso as one of her players at the University of Texas. Grosso, of course, is one of the midfielders 
on the gold medal winning uh, Canadian Olympic team. And so Angie certainly continues to recruit <clears throat> in her homeland in Canada. Uh, and so those are the first two players uh, that are in the Canadian Women's Soccer Hall of Fame that both played for me. So we've always been interested in the elite Canadian players and we recruited uh, the kid that ended up at UCLA um, that we were desperate to get, who's now uh, playing, I think for Chelsea. Um, uh, her uh, father and I became friends, uh, Jesse Fleming. <clears throat> uh, so uh, we've always had huge respect for the elite Canadian players. We also were very aggressive in recruiting uh, uh, Sinclair. I flew out to Burnaby to recruit her, uh, had a spaghetti dinner with her family. Uh, she wanted to come, but actually that year we didn't have much money the first year. Um, and she wanted to come and the mother said no, because you know we need the money the first year. She was willing to use her Canadian national team stipend and sell the car, the family car to join us at North Carolina. But of course we lost her to Portland and Clive Charles, uh, an absolutely brilliant coach. Uh, so we've always uh, chased the elite Canadians. That's awesome. Um, I mean, I, we could talk for hours, but uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This has been uh, really an honor for me uh, talking to you, uh, who you know I've idolized for so long. Uh, just before we go, I've talked about the podcast before in, in, in some of your books, but you obviously know more than I do about those. Uh, can you just tell the listeners a little bit more about your podcast uh, and about some of the books that you have available? Sure. The book you showed originally, um, Training Soccer Champions, was the first book we wrote. That was a book we wrote for coaches. And that book still sells incredibly well. In fact, it sells in all sports. Um, it sells in volleyball because the idea of the competitive cauldron is described very well in one of the chapters. And so that book is still a, a hot seller. Um, so it was the first book we wrote for coaches. The second book we wrote, we wrote for uh, players. And that was the vision of a champion. And that uh, book is also still selling very well. And that's, you know, getting back to our initial conversation about player development. I think coaches that are interested in player development and players that are interested in player development, that book is a great guide on the different things you can do as a player to take your game to the next level, but also as a coach, what you can encourage in your players and structuring your players. And that's like a competitive cauldron 2.0. And so there's some uh, more ideas in that book beyond um, training soccer champions about how to structure your cauldrons. And then the other book, which I didn't write, is a book about our culture written by Tim Carruthers. And that book also continues to sell very well. And the title of that book is The Man Watching. The Man Watching is uh, a Rilke poem title. Uh, and the poem is absolutely brilliant. And that poem captures a lot of of what we consider critical for player development. Because there's a line in the poem to the effect that uh, um, this is the way he grows by being defeated by greater and greater beings. And so basically uh, what Rilke talks about in this poem, and it's a poem about uh, your growing spirituality. Uh, it's about how you actually grow by defeat. And uh, uh, that's sort of interesting because that's exactly the philosophy of the cauldron. Uh, because speaking of Clive Charles in Portland, he took a team to Europe once. And one of the players on his roster was one of my kids. And it was during a stretch when we were just beating everyone to death. So these were teams that like never lost. I mean, they, they didn't just win national championships and ACC tournament championships and ACC regular seasons. They won every game. And so uh, Clive, after I think we had been defeated by some team in Europe, comes up to my player and her name was Danielle Egan, who by the way, is the mother of Gio Reyna, the famous American player that's playing for a Borussia Dortmund. Yep. Uh, so she was the mother, she's the mother of Gio and she uh, uh, gets approached by Clive right after the game and Clive is teasing her saying, and Clive is a great guy because he's the one that called me and told me the story afterwards. Uh, he comes up to her and says, hey Danielle, what does it feel to finally lose a game? And the way Clive tells the story is <clears throat> Daniel turned to him and with steely eyes said at North Carolina coach, we lose in practice every day. In other words, don't you dare, you know, assume I am some sort of effete snob about the game. No, we are, you know, we are challenged in every single practice. So we lose all the time at North Carolina. Uh, so I thought that was a great response uh, from Daniel Egan. So this book, uh, The Man Watching, is about our culture. 
And then right now, actually, there's a Georgetown professor uh, that uh, spent the uh, fall with us named Chris Porath. And uh, she uh, is a Keenan Flagler, a UNC Business School PhD. And she and I are going to write another book on culture. Uh, but basically, The Man Watching is a very readable book about everything we do at North Carolina. And that book has a chapter uh, where all my critics are interviewed. So if you want to know what all of my enemies think of me, uh, this isn't like just a glorious book about everything we've done that's great. All of my enemies will be in there, you know, criticizing me. So it's a very thoroughly well-researched book uh, about our program, but I think it'll also have benefit uh, to anyone that's uh, truly interested in studying uh, uh, what we've done over the years. That's awesome. So those are three books. And then uh, obviously the podcast, yep. the podcast is a chapter by chapter review of the vision of a champion. We've taken a different player or coach that we think replicates a chapter best and interviewed them with the principles involved in the 20 chapters of the vision of a champion podcast. So the best thing to do with the vision of a champion is to buy the book and then read a chapter and then listen to the first podcast. Uh, the first podcast is Mia Hamm, but Christine Lilly's in there. Yeah, Tobin Heath is in there. Lucy Bronze, who uh, recently was considered the best player in the world, the right back for England is in there. And these are all former Tar Heels. Serena Wegman, the new English coach that was the former Dutch coach, played for me during the Mia Hamm era. So uh, Tobin Heath, I mean, all these great uh, UNC players are interviewed. And I think it's, it's going to be something that if you follow along with the book, we'll have a uh, value for any coach and any player. Yeah. And, and I think what's really, what I love about the podcast is every single episode, like you mentioned, you're getting a, a new guest on, but these aren't just like any guests. These are, I don't even want to say world-class because it's beyond world-class. These are the best of the best of the best. And you're getting a unique perspective on something every single episode. And, and I've said this before on the podcast, it, you have to listen to it player coached and there's just there's so much value within that podcast that you know it, it's just it, it's incredible so you know thank you for all the work that you've done um you know the the impact you've had on the game of soccer the women's game and uh for coming on the show so i, I really well, thank you and let me share what the parents have been doing because the kids who come to our camp uh do listen to this podcast and what they say they've been doing with their parents is they'll actually turn the podcast on driving to practice. And then when the parent picks them up at the end of practice, they finish the, the rest of the podcast driving home. And uh, they, the parents have told me that's been a wonderful way to get their kid ready for practice, yeah. uh, but also a nice review after practice driving back to wherever they live. And so it's been a big hit, uh, but I appreciate uh, what you're doing to help us promote it. Uh, so I appreciate that. I've thoroughly enjoyed this interview, by the way. So thank you for your time. I've really enjoyed the questions. And uh, I want to certainly wish you and uh, your listeners great uh, luck in this beautiful game that all of us are involved in, because uh, I am an old man. I'm 70 years old now, but I still absolutely love everything about our game, but also where our game is going. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anson.